we are so thankful for our worship and arts team that has so masterfully led us to the feet of Jesus. I personally, I'm excited um, about this conversation that we are getting ready to have. Uh, we have been in this sermon series all year long that is entitled The Blueprint. And I think that this Blueprint series is so essential to our life because we have been very intentional about having conversations that are going to help us and equip us to actually rediscover biblical Christianity, not, not the cultural Christianity, not the, not the timid Christianity that we see on social media, but a biblical foundation that is going to ground us in our faith. And I'm excited uh, because today I actually want to reiterate something that we discussed in week two of this sermon series. So let's take a moment to pray and then let's dive into this conversation. Um, Father, we are so thankful for all that you are. We are so thankful for your character. We are thankful for your presence. And we are thankful for your word and your instruction that you have left with us. Father, I pray that you would release an anointing that would make this conversation easy. Father, release an anointing that would persuade hearts and perfect habits. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Let everybody say amen. amen. Family, I wanna have a conversation that is entitled, Start It From The Bottom, now we here. Look at your neighbor in the spirit of Arby Graham and say, hey, friend. Hey, friend. Start it from the bottom. Start from the bottom. Now we here. Now we here. <laughs> Family, the disciples walked very closely with Jesus for three years. They had dinner with Jesus. They had many conversations uh, with Jesus. And, and all of their close observations of Jesus, there was only one thing that the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to do. The, the disciples, they were with Jesus when he raised Lazarus from the dead. And the disciples never said, Lord, teach us how to raise our loved ones from the dead. I, I, I would imagine that the disciples had some people in their life, some loved ones that they would love to have another conversation with. I, I'm sure the disciples had people in their life to where if they could just hear that loved one's laughter one more time it would have done their hearts some good. But even though they knew that Jesus had this ability to do this, they never said, Lord, teach us how to raise our loved ones mm -hmm. from the grave. The, the disciples, they were actually with Jesus, working alongside of Jesus when he took two fish and five loaves of bread and fed 5,000 people. Mm -hmm. And the disciples never asked Jesus, Lord, teach us how to take a little bit right. and make it a lot. I don't know if inflation is the same in Richmond <laughs> as it is in the DMV, but the way that these oh, yeah. prices are set up, I would have been having brunch every day <laughs> if I would have been a disciple. But they never asked Jesus, Lord, teach us how to take a little and multiply it and make it a lot. As a matter of fact, some of the disciples, they were actually with Jesus at a wedding. Now, I don't know if they were doing the Tamiya dance at the reception, but I know <laughs> that they were enjoying themselves at this wedding reception. Brittany, they were enjoying themselves so much, they ran out of wine. Mm -hmm. And after they ran out of wine, Jesus said, don't worry about it, I got it. <laughs> and he took tap water and he turned it into wine. And the disciples never said, Lord, teach us how to make bottomless mimosas. <laughs> The, the, the disciples never said, Lord, teach us how to take your living water and turn it into a flight for everybody that's connected to me. But the one thing that the disciples asked Jesus to do, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Here it is. Here's the big idea. I believe that with every miracle that they witnessed Jesus do, they were witnessing an outcome. And throughout the life of Jesus, there were various outcomes that he was able to produce. But the, even though there were various outcomes, there was a common denominator. Prayer was the consistent output to the various outcomes. Mm -hmm. I can show it to you in the text. If you look at uh, Luke chapter 11, if you look at verses 41 through 44, when Lazarus had died and Jesus shows up on the scene, the first thing that Jesus does when he finishes crying is he says, Lord, thank you for hearing me when I pray. As a matter of fact, you always hear me when I pray, but I, I said it out loud for the sake of all these people around me. And I think it was in that moment that the disciples discovered that prayer is the ingredient that unlocks all of my intangibles. So essentially it's in Luke chapter one, verse one through four, where the disciples, they say, Lord, teach us to pray. 
And this is how we historically discover what we now know as the Lord's Prayer. Here's how it reads in the Amplified Version. Jesus responds to their request. And this is our focus scripture for today. He says, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves also forgive everyone indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Family, what I want to do over these next few moments, I want to give you the six implications of prayer. Here's implication number one. The very first thing that Jesus says in the Lord's Prayer is he says, Father. Everybody shout Father. Father. I, I want to let you know something. You need to investigate and, and inspect what is the role and the responsibility of a father. First implication of prayer is refuge. Let me unpack this for a moment. When Jesus says father, the role of a father is to be an emotional support. The role of a father is to be a protector. The role of a father is to be a provider. Now, here is something that I need you to know. Refuge is someone who protects you from danger. I think some of us get frustrated in our prayer life because we have an inaccurate depiction of what danger actually is. I think we believe that protecting us from danger means to protect us from pain. But is it possible that pain and discomfort is actually a catalyst to development? Now, if you break down the word danger, danger is to protect someone from an adverse consequence. Adverse is when you are having a situation where you are preventing development. So if God is our refuge and he protects us from danger, which is to protect us from anything that would stop our development, that means his responsibility is not to protect you from discomfort. His responsibility is to protect you from anything that would stifle your development. Mm -hmm. now, now, here is how I know this to be true. What does Psalms chapter 23 say? Watch this. Psalms chapter 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. How is it in one verse, God is leading me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Okay. But in the very next sentence, I find myself in the valley of the shadow of death. It's because God knows that sometimes the hardest road to take is actually the road that's going to be healthiest for your development. Mm. I remember when I was a little boy, my father was a boxer and my father was teaching me uh, how to box. And my father thought it would be wise to go get one of the bigger kids from the neighborhood <laughs> to come and box with me in the garage. Now, at the current age that I am now, I'm only 5'9 on a good day. <laughs> And my father, y'all yeah, yeah, watch it, watch it. So my father, <laughs> my father decided to get one of the bigger kids from the neighborhood and he outweighed me by at least 100 pounds. And y'all, when my father decided to referee the fight, I was afraid. But I said, you know what? I'm in the presence yeah. of my father. Yeah. He ain't gonna let this go, yeah. but so far, <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> this bigger kid was beating the brakes off of me. And all I could think in this moment, I'm going to call Child Protective <laughs> Services the moment that this is over because I could not reconcile within myself why my father was allowing me to experience this pain. When the fight was over with, and as I'm sitting there wiping off my face, my father began to give me instruction, this is where you went wrong. This is actually where you were supposed to counter. This is actually where you're supposed to put your guard up. What I thought in the moment was poor parenting was actually permissible preparation. Preparation is the act of making someone ready. What my father was actually allowing to take place in that moment, I'm going to allow you to experience a momentary pain because I'm actually gonna give you language for how to defeat giants. But if I never allow you to experience the pain, you never learn the solution on the backside of this. And many times in our prayer life, when we acknowledge God as our father, as our protector, we always think that his role is to protect us from pain. But that's why God sent the Holy Spirit, who was our helper and our comforter. He said, no, I'll help you put yourself back together again after I'll allow you to experience what you experience. But on the other side of this is going to be for your development. So the first thing that Jesus lets us know in the Lord's Prayer is that God is our Father. But because God is our Father, we have to recognize that as a father, his role is to prepare us for our future. So here it is. The next thing that Jesus says is he says, Father, 
whom art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The second implication of prayer is reverence. Here's what I need you to understand is that when he says hallowed be thy name is that he is letting us know that the God whom we serve, who is our father, he is to be set apart. In the ancient world, the name of a person was much more than their name. When you spoke of someone's name, you spoke of their nature. That means that the entirety of who they were is what you were reflecting upon when you were to mention their name. God is holy. Everything about God distinguishes himself from every other being. And what we have to understand is that if we are going to be believers of Christ, we have to live a life of reverence. But reverence is not just what we say out of our mouth. Reverence is how we align our lifestyle with the request of the Father. I can show it to you. God so much desires to be distinguished and set apart. And God so badly wants uh, to be reverenced that he tells the children of Israel, be holy for I am holy. But if you were to ever study the very first commandment that God gives to the children of Israel, when he gives them the 10 commandments, he says, thou shall not have any other gods before me. If you read that scripture in its original language in Hebrew, before me actually means before my face. Follow me. So a sense before me actually means before my face, we have to take into consideration that God is omnipresent, which means that God is at all places at all times. So anything that I do with my life, it's in his face because he is omnipresent and he is at all places at all times. So when God says you shall not have any other God before me, he's essentially saying don't exalt anything in your life above me. Because when you do so, you're playing in my face. Yeah. Newsflash, God was the very first person to establish, don't play in my face. <laughs> God said, I'm a jealous God, and I don't want you to get it twisted. I love you, I'm merciful, I'm gracious, but don't play in my face. Yeah. So even in the Lord's prayer, it was much more than Jesus giving the disciples a prayer language. He was actually giving them principles and practices for a lifestyle. So the first implication of prayer that we have discussed is that uh, we recognize that God is our refuge. We recognize that God is someone who should be reverenced. But here it is. Uh, our Father, whom art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then he says, thy kingdom come. The second implication of prayer is regulation. Here it is. I need you to understand something. When Jesus says, thy kingdom come, what he is actually saying is, is that we want the kingdom of heaven to be inaugurated in the earth. So since we want the kingdom of heaven to be inaugurated in the earth, that means that flowing out of reverence is a humble submission to God's regulations. Please understand me. Justice is kingdom. So you cannot claim that you are kingdom, but then you don't have a heart for justice. This is why I could never follow a leader who says, oh, no, that's that's not my assignment to discuss that. I, I just want to show up and preach the gospel. We don't have to talk about justice during Black History Month because that's not my assignment. Well, God is kingdom and God is a just God. So justice is kingdom. If I say that kingdom come, that, that will be done, uh, God is a generous God. So if I am going to be kingdom, that means that generosity should be flowing out of my life. If God is merciful, then that means that mercy should be flowing out of my life. So when I say thy kingdom come, what I'm really saying is, God, we welcome your systems, your structure, and your spirit here on the earth. And everything that you allow to be regulated in the kingdom is what we should be replicating here on the earth. Here it is. Here's the next implication of prayer. I love this. This is one of my favorites. He says, God, give us each day our daily bread. The next implication of prayer is resource. What he's essentially letting us know is that God is responsible for our life essentials. Here it is. When something is a resource, you have to understand that God provides the assets that are necessary for our daily operation. The, the, the old saints used to say it like this, and we sing this sometimes in our R, RVA campus. All I have needed, thy hands have provided but Jesus says this, he says, give us each day our daily bread, which means that God, whatever is necessary for, and whatever is essential for me today, I am trusting and depending on you to provide it. Because prayer is actually a function of trust and dependency. 
God, I'm actually trusting you and I am dependent upon you to provide something for me that I cannot provide for myself. And a lot of times I think when we think of resources, we immediately think financial. But no, God is saying, no, the peace that you need, I can provide that for today. The, the strength that you need, I could provide that for today. Come on. Some of us needed that strength in the 21 days of prayer and fasting. Lord, give us this day our daily bread, our daily apples. Give us this day our daily soup. Give us this day our daily salad. God is saying that whatever you need, my God today, he is saying that I have enough to provide it. Here it is. Here is the next implication. I love this. And this is super important. He says, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. The fifth implication of prayer is reconcile. But this is not reconciliation in the way that you might initially think. Hear me. Reconcile by definition is to cause to coexist in harmony, to make or show to be compatible. Please don't miss this. He says, Lord, forgive us for our trespasses. That's what he's asking God to do. As we ourselves forgive those who trespass against us. Essentially, he is saying, Father, what I see you do, I need to be making sure that my behaviors are compatible with what I see you do. He asked God to do something in one sentence. And then in the following sentence, he is saying, now, God, what I'm asking for you to do, I now need to replicate that in my life. God, what I am asking you to do, I need to make sure that my lifestyle is compatible with what I'm asking you to do. And essentially what he is saying is, God, make me look like you. Have you ever, y'all, this is real petty, but I'm going to say it anyway. Have you ever looked at somebody's child and gone, man, somebody is lying. This child don't look nothing like this father. There's something going on. I don't know, y'all have watched Maury. Don't act like I'm the only one who after school <laughs> We'll watch some more show and be like, I don't even need the test results to see that you is not the pappy. And sometimes I would imagine that God looks like uh, at us the same way. Mm. You honor me with your lips, but you look nothing like me. That's good. That's good. You claim me as your father, but your behavior does not mirror mine. You, you claim me as your father, but you don't love the way that I love. Mm. You, you don't give the way that I give because for I so love the world that I gave my only begotten son. I sacrifice when I love. You claim you love me, but you won't even sacrifice 10%. It's tight, but it's right. You, you, you claim <laughs> that you love me, but nothing about your life mirrors, reflects, or replicates mine. So when Jesus says, Lord, forgive us our, trans, uh, uh, our transgressions as we forgive those who trespass against us, he's essentially saying, Father, every single thing that I ask you to do, I have that same expectation of myself. Father, what I'm asking you to do, I need to make sure that I mirror that same behavior here on the earth. Hear me, prayer is not just the place where I make my petitions. Prayer is the place where I make my practices compatible with the Father. Say it one more time for the note takers who didn't get it. Prayer is not just the place where I make my petitions. Prayer is the place where I make my practices compatible with the Father's. Jesus shows us that prayer is the place where I say, Lord, make what I do compatible with what you do. Prayer is the place where I say, Lord, reconcile my behavior to reflect the behavior that I see from you. Here it is. Here's the last implication of prayer, he lastly says, and lead us not into temptation. Another translation goes on to say, but deliver us from evil. Last implication of prayer is rescue. But I, I want to make sure that I make this clear what we are asking to be rescued from. This is not saying, God, rescue me from my adversary. Because the Bible lets us know that we are fighting in a fixed fight. So I don't need to be rescued from someone who was already defeated. So when he says, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, he's not saying deliver me from the hand of the evil one. When he says lead us not into temptation, temptation is to be drawn away by your own desires. So when he says lead us not into temptation, he is asking God, you know the desires of my heart. And the desires of my heart are not always pleasing. So God, don't lead me into my desires, but lead me into your destiny. <laughs> because my desires do not always lead me to a place of destiny. Sometimes my desires will lead me into a place of destruction. 
But God, since you are omniscient, which means that you are all knowing, you know my desires. So lead me away from the desires that actually might be destructive towards me. So essentially, and, and here's my thing. There are a lot of people who are like, well, no, my desires are good. The Lord knows my heart. I got a good heart. I'm glad you said that. Here's what the Lord says about your heart. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 through 10 says, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives, and I give people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. Mm -hmm. Jesus is not asking God, God, deliver me from other people. He's saying, Lord, and whatever you do, lead me not into temptation and consistently deliver me from me. Maybe in this season, we need to take the Michael Jackson approach because Michael Jackson said, I'm starting with the man in the mirror. And maybe your greatest adversary has not been the enemy that you think it is. Is it possible that the person in the mirror has been your greatest adversary from the destiny that God has called you to? So Jesus lets us know in a very practical way that your request and your petition to be, Lord, deliver me away from what would be destructive to my life. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's open it up for questions. Awesome. So I have a question. Yeah. Um, my question is, for the person that's new to prayer and they yeah. feel like, hey, God, I'm bringing my desires to you, how do they begin to posture their hearts to really hear what his desires are for themselves and just hear God for themselves? That is a great question. Um, I think that the word of God always has to be a point of reference for his will in his way. I think oftentimes what happens is people will develop a great prayer life and then they don't have a point of reference as to what God is saying because they don't read their word. Mm -hmm. Listen, reading God's word and devotion has to go hand in hand. You have to create margin in your day to be able to consume his word. Because if you do not consume the word of God, you have no point of reference to know, is this my voice or is this God's voice? Because God will never say or instruct you to do anything that goes outside of his word. But if you don't know what his word is, you don't have a point of reference or nothing to weigh on the scale. Is this the word of God? Does this sound like God? Does this mirror his heart? You discover his heart through reading his word. So as a new believer, you have to read just as much as you pray. It cannot be one without the other, but both practices have to be mirrored together. Listen, family, thank you so much for tuning in to this Shalom conversation. We pray that this conversation has been a blessing to you. Until we see you all again, God bless.